Uh, welcome to my uh, talk on uh, scaling, agile scaling unicorns and how to tame them. Um, I don't know how many of you read the abstract or you just read the title and thought, oh, that looks cool because it might have a unicorn in it. <laughs> uh, well, it did. Um, my name's Martin Hinchelwood. I'm a professional Scrum trainer with Scrum.org. I run my own uh, consulting company out of uh, uh, Scotland and uh, Mexico, which is kind of fun. Um, I do uh, talks and things all over the world, but quite mostly I, I live uh, here in Glasgow. If you're wondering what the color coding is, the yellow is the smart people. <laughs> and uh, that's every constituency in Scotland is, is yellow. And the blue are these folks. who, who I'm, I'm not really that happy with. Um, but I am going to, uh, I, I, tra I travel all over the place for, for work. I have uh, customers in many different countries. I spend about 250 days a year traveling, which is quite a lot. Um, but it means I get to see lots of interesting places, lots of different cultures, lots of different experiences uh, using Agile, Scrum, DevOps, all of those things. Um, I'm a Microsoft MVP in well, I guess it's developer technologies these days, but um, working with the Azure DevOps team, um, and I'm running a, a workshop on Saturday on Azure DevOps services. Uh, but what I wanted to talk today was um, about scaling Scrum. How do you uh, take the ideas of Scrum and do them at a larger scale? Um, Microsoft do this uh, with the Azure DevOps team. They have 45, 42 teams uh, working on one product. Uh, I have a customer up in uh, Norway, just near Oslo, um, that has, I think they've got, um, how many have they got now? Nine, 96 odd teams in 13 locations in nine different countries, all working on one product. Uh, so that's always fun. Uh, and there's folks like Office who have something like 600 teams working on the Office product. And they all have to ship out of, almost out of the same box. I mean, you can imagine how Office might break down, uh, but there's lots of things that are important in that story. And I think we need to not forget uh, that things are changing much more rapidly now. That's why most organizations are moving towards uh, a greater degree of business agility, because the business is changing. Stuff in the market's changing. What users want is changing faster, and users are expecting more interaction with the companies that are providing uh, the software that they're building. So we need to, we need to leverage that, but can I, what, what can happen if you don't do that? I've, I have a little example for you guys. Um, you might have heard of it. It's a story about how a company with nearly $400 million in the bank went bankrupt in 45 minutes because of a deployment. And it's this uh, Knight Capital Group that was listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Um, they have uh, they had a new, new version of their product. They were shipping it to, to production. Uh, they'd been working on it for quite a long time. Uh, the new version, um, something like six months of work had gone into it, so six months of new code. Uh, and they were replacing the old code, but the old system was nine years old. It had lots of unused code, lots of technical debt uh, in the product. And you can imagine how uh, 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 you know, that might make things a little bit more complicated. But in their wisdom, the engineers decided that it would be a good idea to repurpose a software flag that was already in the system. Let's not write a new flag, let's just use one that already exists in the system uh, to turn this new feature on. Um, but when they went to do the deployment, the deployment engineers only deployed to seven of the eight environments in production. It's just the level of complexity going on. And then they went live. And they started losing $172,000 per minute while they were live. Because the system wasn't working. They couldn't figure out why. They tried to fix it, but it was just an impossible puzzle to go figure out which, which system had not been deployed to, even knowing that that was the thing that was the problem, uh, was significantly difficult for them. Um, and they ended the day losing $460 million. So I get an interesting question for you. What's the impact to your organization of not 
getting features in front of your customers or having poor quality or not getting the right thing in front of your customers at the right time? What does it mean to your business? Yeah, are you familiar with the cost of delay? What's the cost of not getting a feature in front of customers? But also what happens if it's poor quality and doesn't work properly? Customers lose interest, lose trust. If you've got an app on a phone, they're just going to delete it and go find somebody else that does a similar thing. Uh, one of the reasons we know so much about what happened to Knight Capital Group is when they filed for bankruptcy, they have to say why they're filing for bankruptcy. Uh, so that's from the bankruptcy filing. Uh, they, they had no procedures for code reviews. They had no procedures for uh, more than one person doing the same work. So the engineer that deployed to seven of the eight servers was just one engineer. He had nobody helping him, nobody checking his work, uh, nobody doing those things. So um, it just didn't work. And it's not an unusual occurrence. Um, I had a customer in Chicago who I sat with their deployment engineers. And they're, they're the only company I've ever worked with that has so much technical debt. They've got twice as many testers as coders in their company. They've got uh, uh, 200 uh, coders and 400 testers because they have to do 9,000 hours of manual QA to validate that their product works before they ship it to production. And it gets worse because I sat with their engineers when they were doing the deployment and they were literally uh, copying and pasting different versions of the same DLL from folders, trying the application and seeing what worked. Yeah, no versioning across any of their, their, feet, their, their product set, 50 services uh, running across 20 different servers. You can get into a real mess and lots of places don't realize the risk, don't realize the problem they're in. Um, so one of the things, how do you stop getting into those problems? We have to practice. We have to practice a lot, which means we have to do deployments constantly. And that's where we talk about continuous delivery, not just of product into production, but of value to customers. And we need to focus on that value. Can you think of any other epic failures uh, that you might have heard of? I have, I have two for, for, for uh, very different reasons. One is uh, poor quality ship to production. This is a product uh, that the company uh, struggled to get it into production. Uh, it was supposed to take three years to ship. They ended up shipping after six years. And at one point in the company, they took 70,000 engineers off what else they were doing to go fix bugs in this product in order to ship it. They managed to ship it. You think of another scenario? Mine is uh, mismatching to customer desires. A product that took three years to build, get it in front of your customers, and customers go, whoa, what is this horrible thing? <laughs> right? This was Microsoft's catalyst to change. When Satya took over Microsoft, one of the things that he did almost immediately was tell all of the engineering teams that they had to have working software in production at least every 30 days. Take the code that developers are working on have to be in front of users, users using them in production within 30 days on every product at Microsoft. Windows is almost there, Office is there, the, the Visual Studio teams are all there. It's, it's a big transformation and you need to focus on certain things because it's about that uh, collaboration of people that is the thing that gives us the biggest benefit uh, for, for uh, solving these problems. It's not a technology problem. We hire smart people, they can figure out that stuff. Uh, we need to figure out the technologies because there's, there's an interesting uh, uh, problem and that's, you know, we want to release products but we get feedback for our customers and they're either happy or not, yeah? Um, if you've ever videoed customers using your software when they're not, you know, you try and create a situation where they're not totally aware that they're being videoed and the amount of swearing they do at the screen is a good indicator of the level of quality on your, of your product. And part of that is about value delivery. I've got a, a, an exact, this is um, data from industry standard data. So uh, uh, assembled averages across um, all, of, all, of, all industries building software. Uh, there's about 70,000 projects uh, run across, uh, uh, across the world in, in the data sample. Um, but 
for every 100 euros spent, how much value do you deliver in your product? Anybody know? Rough, rough averages. You could be better, you could be worse. Rough averages. Well, we've got three problems. We've got what, who, and how. Okay, what are we going to go build? Who, how are they working together to go do that? And then how, what are the engineering practices that we're using? Uh, we actually only spend 35% of our time building the right features. So, okay, so now we've only got 35 euros left of our 100 euros. Uh, we lose 50% of our time for poor communication and collaboration in teams. Okay, so that means we've got, what, 17 euros 50 left? Something like that. And we only spend 30% of our time building new features. The rest of the time is struggling with technical debt, struggling with the complexity of the software that's built up over time. If you're working in Greenfield, this number might be better. Yeah, at least for a couple of years, and then it'll end up like this. And you'd be surprised that the bigger the organization is, the worse these numbers are. These are averages that include lots of small companies. I worked with a bank in the US, and they believed that you know, there's no way we only spend 35% of our time working on the right features. It's way more than that. We know our customers really well. So we added telemetry to their products. And after six months of assessing the data, we found out it was more like 10% for them because they didn't know their customers. They didn't know what they really wanted. And the reality is nobody does. And while I'm doing it with a hundred dollars, sorry, a hundred euros, we get five euros 25 out the other end. What if it's a million euros? That's 52,000 out of a million euros spent on delivering value in your product. We have to change. Yeah, we have to do something differently. Um, a lot of these projects are traditional. And one of the things that makes it hard to change is this magic word, culture. Culture's not really a thing you can just go change. It's like a shadow. It's like a reflection of just how we do things around here. So you need to change the way you do things, and the culture will change along with it. So you need to focus on that part. But one of the things a lot of organizations struggle with is how do we get started? Where do we start in these things? And they actually do something a little bit interesting. They copy somebody else. You go copy somebody else. And that's okay in moderation to copy somebody else to go try something. Uh, but every organization is unique and what works in one company might not work in another company. Netflix is a holacracy. You guys get good software from Netflix. Yeah, it works, very rarely goes down, high quality. We like what they're doing, yeah? Anybody unhappy with Netflix? So not a single person in the room is unhappy with Netflix. They don't have any managers. They don't have a hierarchical structure at all. Every employee, when they're hired, there's the coffee machine, there's the toilets, there's the teams. Go figure out what you would like to do to better this company. That's a holacracy. Will that work everywhere? No way. You know, most organizations I go into, they, they rely on that hierarchy and they can't change it quickly. So they want to just find something somebody else is doing and install it, and then we're done. So that's where some of uh, uh, these uh, things have come from. You've got the Spotify model, which you might have heard of. The Spotify model is awesome, works really well for Spotify. If you've read the Spotify white paper, which some of you may have done, um, it's not what Spotify do now. It's what they did at the point in time when that paper was written, and they've moved on since then. It was a, here's what we're doing that works for us. SAFE also, if you've heard of the Scaled Agile Framework, SAFE also came uh, from an organization that Dean Leafingwell uh, managed to convert to agility using some of the practices that were in his Agile Requirements book. Um, and then copy that blueprint, go and try and do it in other places, and it doesn't always work. It doesn't always mean the same thing. Sometimes it adds more complexity to the organization, sometimes less, which is why if you've been following, say, 4.0, everything's optional, rather than everything being required, um, to try and combat that idea. So I like to say that there's no such thing as best practices. 
only adequate practices for the situation at hand. What works today might not work tomorrow. Yeah, what works in Netflix might not work in, uh, uh, I don't know, I'm trying to think of a local company. The Radisson, I don't know, whatever. Uh, it might not work somewhere else. So there's something that, that we want, want to talk about, and that's Scrum and having a, a guiding framework rather than a methodology. The difference is that in a methodology, it tells you how to go do the thing. Everything that you do is documented and we just keep doing it the same way. But that's a best practices idea, which doesn't work in our world, doesn't work in the creative world. Um, so we're talking about uh, Scrum is just an implementation of the Agile base class and supports a single team. Everything you read about core Scrum, the Scrum guide, all of the, the, the training that you might see that's about Scrum is about one team. It's not about many teams working together, it's about one group of people uh, working together and it's defined in the Scrum guide. And that's the, the, the definition of uh, Scrum from the Scrum guide. Helps, helps people effectively address complex problems productivi productively and creatively delivering products of the highest possible value. There's lots of things that I bet you think is part of Scrum that are actually not Scrum at all. Who's heard of user stories? Not Scrum. Nothing to do with Scrum. It's a completely separate thing that is useful. It's a useful practice, but it may not work everywhere. I work with a customer in Norway that they have to build uh, models of ships that go in a simulator and they hide the, the ship models are so detailed they have to have uh, uh, hydrodynamic models of how the water would interact with the ship's hull. Do you think a user story is good enough for that? It's not. They can't do it with that. They do something different. Yeah, if you're building an API, would you write everything as a user story? Probably not. It probably doesn't make sense. You might do use cases. You might do different models. Okay. Uh, have you heard of story points? Not Scrum. Nothing to do with Scrum. Good practice, at least at the beginning, but not anything to do with Scrum. There's lots of things that we do constantly. Daily Scrums, people call them daily stand-ups because standing up is a good practice that maybe helps make the event shorter. Okay, awesome. It's a good practice. We don't have to do it. In Norway, they do daily plank. That's fun. They're very fit in Norway. So the first thing we need to do is focus on the core values of Scrum. Read the Scrum guide again. If you've read it before or you've not read it in a long time, read it again. Understand what your choices are. And I think there's more choices than we generally think there are. Do Scrum well. Yeah, that gets us to mechanical Scrum. Yeah, we're just following, following, following the core set of rules. I like to think if, if I go out and buy Monopoly, does it come with a rule book or a strategy guide? It comes with a rule book. Does the rule book help you win? No, it doesn't help you win. You need to come up with your own strategies and each player comes up with their own strategies. But if we're playing in a collaborative game that result is working software, what are the strategies that are going to work with you based on the software your organization? All those kind of things. So we need to add something to this. One of those things is practices. We've got both people practices and engineering practices. If you're not doing a, a build stuff conference, probably everybody in here is doing uh, software engineering. Um, but I work with a lot of organizations that are not doing any software, but they still want to use Scrum. So this stuff on the left is the same, but the stuff on the right changes to what's their context. Yeah, if you're, you're doing marketing uh, uh, launches or organizing events for people, those things on the right are going to be a little bit different. What's going to be on your definition of done is different, but it's the same ideas. And then there's a third thing we need as well as those practices. We need values. We need something to help us make better decisions to at least have a common set of uh, things that allow us to make those better decisions. And the Scrum values, which are in the Scrum Guide, they're in the second paragraph of the Scrum Guide, they're that important, are courage, focus, commitment, respect, and openness. Hopefully there's nothing on that list that you or your organization go, no, we don't want that here. But how many organizations actually have it? 
actually have those things. I'm sure you can come up with all sorts of stories in your own organization for where these things didn't happen. So what you result, if you have all of those things, you've got technical excellence, the values and principles, and the core set of rules, the guiding uh, principles. Uh, we have professional scrum rather than amateur scrum. Amateur scrum is we're not, we're not really doing everything. We kind of pick and choose stuff. It's, it's not really scrum, is it? If you bought Monopoly and everybody decided to play by their own rules, are we playing Monopoly or are we just using Monopoly board and pieces? Same idea. But that gets us somewhere, at least for one team, because it's people and teams working together which will be a competitive advantage for you because it's really rare. How many organizations have you worked with where they really have teams? And I don't mean something they call teams that's more like a, more like a call center team than, a, than an actual team of people who collaborative work, collaboratively work together to achieve a goal. That's what we talk about in Scrum. Collaborative, uh, getting all dry mouthed. Uh, so there are things uh, that happen that lead us to what is effectively mini waterfall. It's a common anti-pattern in Scrum. You're following all the rules. You have all of the events. You have all of the roles. You have all of the pieces. But it just ends up being a mini waterfall because inside of the sprint, um, that's what you do. So don't let it be a mini waterfall. Again, read, read the Scrum guide again. Because Scrum has strengths, but Scrum has weaknesses as well. It's optimized for value delivery and it's well defined. Yeah, it's optimized for that. And we can, we can all refer back to the rule book when we've got an argument over how, how the f it fundamentally should work. But it can be just that mini waterfall. So Scrum is not that unicorn that you're looking for. It's just one of the things uh, that we want to do. Because quite often, I've seen a lot of organizations doing Scrum and it more often to look like this than it is to look like uh, a professional team delivering software. Yeah, they're all okay, by the way. Uh, one of the things that we have to bring in to our ideas is monitoring flow. If anybody's read Don Reinertsen's book, Flow, um, it's so heavy in math, it's really hard to get through. Uh, but it's a really powerful book, but it really boils down to uh, Little's Law, which is average lead time equals work in progress over average throughput. And this is from Kanban. And Kanban works really well as a complementary practice along with Scrum. They are not antagonistic. They work together. It's not one or the other. You can use both. Yeah? And there's a guide from Scrum.org, which is the Kanban guide for Scrum teams, which was written by Daniel Vacanti, um, who is uh, one of the founding members of Lean Kanban University with David Anderson. Um, and he was also at Corbus with David Anderson when they developed the Kanban method. Uh, so the, 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 the folks that are really into how Kanban works understand that it's complementary to the Scrum story. Scrum can get you a jump start towards getting more value, uh, but Kanban works too. And do, you guys familiar with Kanban? Yeah, what are the um, five things that we need in order to say that we're doing Kanban. Do you know what they are? We need to visualize our work. We need to limit our work in process. If you don't have whip limits on your boards, not Kanban. These are the core rules. Actively manage items in progress. Actively make decisions about which thing you're doing first, which thing you're not. You have to have explicit policies. Definition of done is an explicit policy. Explicit policies on each move between the boards, and we want to work together to improve collaboratively. So we'll be making improvements and changes to that board, to how we work, constantly running experiments to see what's better. If you don't have all of those things, then maybe you're not doing professional Kanban either. It's professional Scrum, 
add professional Kanban, now we're managing flow and getting that continuous delivery into production. Because the only foundation for scale is professional teams. If you take a bunch of amateurs and have 10 teams of amateurs try and work together to build this massive piece of software, what do you think is going to happen? It's going to be a mess. So I like to take this and add that manage flow. You have to be managing your flow as well. Uh, but there's something very important to note about scaling. Don't scale. Unless you absolutely have to, don't scale. Take a team, make them a professional scrum team, improve their engineering practices, improve their understanding of the work. That will improve the amount of work that they deliver. Yeah? Once you're there, then start focusing on flow with one team. Get them good at delivering real product to production, the right product to production. Then you might think about taking two teams that are there and putting them together. Because what happens is we believe that if we add two teams, we get this linear progression of, you know, we get twice as much work done if we add two teams. But the problem is, have you ever tried to integrate software that people have spent two weeks working on? Doesn't always work out. So what generally happens is you get a flat line at some point, it's not worth adding more teams. And if you add any more, it starts to get much worse. Um, and it generally ends up a little bit like uh, this, which I always think takes too long to run, but it's funny nonetheless. I use the same slide for Git merge as well. Yeah, you don't want, you don't want everything crashing uh, together when you bring your teams together. So Scrum.org have developed something called Nexus, the Nexus framework. Nexus is about what's the minimum we need to do to maintain an empirical process control system like we have with Scrum. What's the minimum we need to do while maintaining those communication lines that we need. So it's not about, you know, it's not the big next, uh, uh, safe diagram that you saw. It doesn't talk about portfolio at all. That's still somebody else's problem in this story. It's, it's a problem we need to address, but it's not part of this. This is about how do we get three to nine engineering teams to work together and deliver working software? Yeah? So it's not, if you've got one team and one product, just use Scrum. You don't need anything else. If you've got one team and many products, you're just out of luck. There's nothing that can help you there. You just have to deal with that context switching, which you lose a lot of time for. You've got to deal with that miscommunication. That's something you just have to deal with. If you have uh, many teams and many products, that's portfolio management. So that's not part of Nexus. Nexus doesn't talk about portfolio management. Scrum.org do have a story for that. It's something called Scrum Studio, which KLM have been implementing recently. Um, but that's not what we're talking about here. So this is one product, but many teams. You can use Nexus. So we had the Scrum as an implementation of the Agile base class. And then we're going to inherit from Scrum. See, I like to put things in coding terms. Inherit from Scrum and add some more roles, events, and artifacts in order to maintain that minimum ability to ship working software. You'll get a copy of the slides. So Nexus is fairly straightforward. It kind of looks like the Scrum diagram, except there's an extra concept. There's that understanding of um, we probably need people to talk more. If we're going to have six teams working together, they probably need to talk about stuff. They probably need to talk about dependencies. They probably need to talk about architecture. They probably need to talk about backlog refinement. They probably need to talk about specializations because you're going to have specialist people. You can't get away from that. If you're working for an airline and you have 10 teams working on a product, but you only have three mainframe specialists, well, only three teams can do mainframe. That's just the way it is. There's not any way around that realities. So everywhere you see this little nexus word, think of it as a team of teams 
trying to avoid Scrum of Scrums. Scrum of Scrums, um, a lot of people use that term really loosely, as in it can mean anything they want. But Scrum of Scrums, in its original intent, meant the Scrum Masters get together and talk about stuff. But the Scrum Masters don't necessarily understand the work. They don't necessarily understand the engineering. They don't necessarily understand the, the, the product. They're Scrum Masters. Their focus is facilitation, is lean agile practitioner, helping people get better. Yeah, so Scrum of Scrums isn't gonna help you here, but we do take the abstract idea of Scrum of Scrums is team of teams. You get a group of people together that are the right people. You ever work, done an open space? Who's the right people that turn up at an open space? The people that turn up. Yeah, the right people will come. So if you have, before your sprint planning, you have an additional nexus sprint planning where the right people, and you might have a, a practice that decides who those right people are, but Scrum's not gonna tell you how to do that. Nexus isn't gonna tell you to do that. The right people turn up and collaborate on what they need to feed into those teams. Because you're gonna have one backlog. We've got one massive backlog. How are we going to divide that between the teams? How do they know what it is they're going to work on? What the dependencies are? So there's probably going to do some dependency management exercises in there. You're probably going to look at what specializations you have in the teams, what time you have with the teams. Because ultimately, I could have teams in West US, East US, uh, Lithuania, Hyderabad, and Australia, and it's going to take 24 hours for this event to finish. It might be 48 hours, depending on how bad the time zone is. And we've got a team in, I don't know, uh, Hawaii. Everybody wants to be on that team. But massive time zone shift. So you might have uh, uh, this gets together, and then they take their time doing their uh, sprint planning in their own time zone. So everybody's not awake. Obviously, a better practice would be to have everybody in the same time zone, but we don't always have that problem, have that uh, advantage. And then we have a Nexus sprint backlog, which is the whole sprint backlog for every team. So we get holistic visibility on everything. Yes, I have seen teams try to do this with stickies on a wall, and you've got a lot of running around updating stickies. Most people then move towards a tool. This is the point where uh, uh, Scrum.org and a lot of the Kanban folks would say, right, now we need a tool. We need to look at Jira, we need to look at Azure DevOps, we need to look at something that allows us all to share the same view, especially if you're in multiple locations around the world. Before that, one team, stickies on the wall. Yeah, is the best way uh, to do things. And I'm saying that as somebody who loves Azure DevOps, stickies on the wall is way better uh, for everything. And then we need to work to deliver software, and we very specifically say three to nine teams. More than nine teams, you're still gonna have problems. Less than three teams, why do you need Nexus? If you've got less than three people, you don't even need Scrum. Stick them at desks next to each other and give them some stuff and let them go figure it out. Yeah, we don't need to create a big plan. But we need to have working software at the end of every iteration that's 30 days or less. So how do you make sure you have working software? Well, maybe we need another accountability because there's three accountabilities in Scrum. Accountability for the backlog, which is the product owner. Accountability for uh, um, quality, which is the development team. And you get accountability for the process, which is the Scrum Master. But we kind of need who's accountable for delivery of working software across nine teams working together. So we have this idea of a Nexus integration team that's not really a dedicated team. You might have a build team in your organization. That's usually the wrong way to do it. It should be, a, again, a team of teams. They get together to figure out the problems when they need to and then disseminate that work to the teams to do the work. I like to think of them as a, a group of uh, uh, DevOps and Agile consultants, yeah? That they're consulting for the rest of the Nexus and they work on a team, they get together to figure out how they're gonna strategically so solve problems and then they go back to the teams and help coach the teams to figuring, figuring some of those things out. But they're usually engineering background because they are accountable 
for integrating the product, making sure there's integrated product at the end of the sprint. Then we have a review, but we have, uh, sorry, we have a, a daily nexus, because every day there's going to be problems. If my team has a problem with this other team, how do I make sure they know about it? Representatives from the teams need to get together, have a discussion, figure out what needs to be known by everybody else, and then take that into the other daily scrums. And this could be 15 minutes and 15 minutes. Yeah, it doesn't need to be more than that. It's about knowledge and synchronization, not about solving problems. Figure out what the things are we need to uh, highlight and make sure are known. And when we do our retrospective, we have the same thing. We've got um, some things, what are the problems at the nexus level, at these nine teams working together level that we need to feed to the other teams to try and come up with awesome solutions and changes that we're going to make, and then bring that information back together. So it's not really that much more than Scrum itself. This is how do we make sure that, that all of those teams work together. So I just got highlighted in there the extra bits. So there's one extra role for an extra accountability. There's two extra event, uh, so artifacts to provide transparency. Because one of the key things in Scrum is transparency. If you don't have transparency, you can't see what's going on. If you can't see what's going on, you can't change effectively because you're changing based on falsehoods, yeah? So the product backlog is your transparency of the future. What are we going to do next? Your sprint backlog is the transparency of now. What are we working on just now? And your integrated increment, which I don't like that word, but it's very appropriate, is transparency of the past. What have we done? That's why it's always working software, because that gives us transparency. So we have to add, we're going to have to have a goal for the nexus that each team uh, comes up with their own goals to work towards. So that's an artifact in itself to provide transparency. What are we all going towards? And then we have to have the Nexus Sprint Backlog, which is the amalgamation of all the other things. So we have additional transparencies. And then we have some additional events, a little bit of uh, uh, replacement there. We have a Nexus Sprint Planning and, as well as the Sprint Planning. And they're to provide additional moments to inspect and adapt. They're inspecting and adapting at the Nexus level. The existing Scrum events are still inspecting, adapting at the team level. Does that make sense? Yeah, so we're not changing Scrum at all. We're just inheriting from it and then adding some extra stuff to make sure we have the minimum, minimum framework that we need to make sure we're all going in the same direction rather than all off in different directions. Yeah? But scaling requires a bunch of complementary practices. Bunch of complementary practices. You're going to need a certain amount of alignment the bigger the group you have working together, the more alignment you will need. But you also need autonomy. These are the general things that we have to cope with in our organization. The practices that the team chooses, you know, are they going to do TDD? ATDD, acceptance test driven development? Are they going to do story points? Are they going to stand up during their daily scrums? These are all practices that they may or may not choose to do. Each team is going to create a plan. We, we've got common understanding of what things are, taxonomy. Yeah, what do we name things? If we're all calling things different things, it's going to be a problem. If when I say a, a unit test, the other team thinks, oh, I just click F5, click through the application, close it, that's a unit test. I do have a customer that thinks that that's a unit test, by the way. That's why I mentioned that one. Yeah, if you change the definition from the core, then nobody knows what we're talking about. Cadence, teams, roles, and organization. We need some sort of alignment. And the sweet spot is organization, roles, teams, cadence, and taxonomy should be aligned. We should have alignment there. We should all be doing the same thing at that level. But the plan and the practices, let the teams figure that out. Let the individual teams figure out what makes the most sense for their team and their part of the software in their context. Yeah? If you're building, I have a, 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 a teams that I work with and they're building firmware for pacemakers. So they have some teams that work on the FUMP firmware, some teams that work on the desktop software that doctors use to configure the pacemakers, and some teams that work on the hardware side. 
Does it make sense that they all have the same definition of done? Does it make the sense that they all have the same uh, uh, set of practices? They all have to do TDD, and the, 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 the hardware guys are scratching their head going, how do I do TDD with this pacemaker? Yeah. So if you've read uh, Dan Pink's book, if you've not, I would highly recommend it. If you're not a reader, I know a lot of people aren't, um, if you're not a reader, there's a 15-minute YouTube video with the hand-drawing thing that explains uh, the, the, the high-level um, bits, also on Blink as well. Uh, but the three things that gives us as humans purpose in the modern world, so we're not talking about factory workers here, we're talking about knowledge workers, is autonomy, mastery, and purpose. We want to feel like we're in charge of what we do. Yeah? In Scrum, the team chooses which things to work on on their backlog gives you autonomy. We're deciding what we go do. We want to have mastery. I want to be good at my job. I want to do the right thing. I want to um, have uh, uh, mastery in my work, take pride in my work. I don't come into work every day and say, I want to do a bad job today. Yeah, we all want to do good jobs. So that's mastery. And we want to have, so being put under explicit time pressure to deliver software makes you work faster, which makes you trip up, which reduces quality, which means you don't feel like you're a master of your profession. You feel like you're just a monkey churning out code. Yeah, we don't feel good about that. We want mastery and we want purpose. I wanna feel like the code I write benefits somebody in some way. Yeah, some software that's harder than others. If I'm building, uh, um, I don't know, some marketing website, I want to understand what, what the purpose is so that I feel like I'm doing something of value. If you're building firmware for pacemakers, it's probably a little bit easier, as long as you're not killing a bunch of people, I guess. Um, but autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And we have this idea at general, again, generics, of Epic's features, uh, backlog items, and tasks. In and in a, in a pyramid, we have the fewest Epics, and we have the most tasks, yeah? But we also need a, a, a alignment and autonomy there as well. And the, the line's kind of just at the bottom of features. You need alignment so the big picture, the business goals are apparent or obvious or what we're trying to achieve. We've got those um, uh, uh, features and epics uh, that we're trying to achieve. For example, for the whole of the developer division, at Microsoft, which is 4,000 people working on lots of products, there were six uh, epics in the last cycle. That's six, that's it. One of them was uh, uh, um, help customers understand and action technical debt. How big is that? That's, that's a huge thing. What would you do for that? Well, I don't know yet. Yeah, we'll figure it out as we go because we're going to do lots of little experiments down here because we have autonomy. The teams themselves need to figure out what they're going to go do to achieve that business goal. Potentially at the Nexus level, um, at the Scrum level, you've got a product owner who owns the backlog. At the Nexus level, the product owner owns a backlog that has nine teams working against it. They can't go into the same level of detail. So you raise this bar and you let the teams who have somebody on the team helping them to manage their product backlog and their tasks themselves. That's their autonomy. They decide what to do to go and achieve the business goals. Just like a military unit. The military doesn't tell every individual soldier what to go do. They give them a goal and say, go figure it out. Yeah? The stuff we have in our head on command and control is all about the, the training that they get in order to know what the next most right thing to do. And if you're building teams, start small. If you need to scale out, start small. There's two uh, main ways uh, to build teams. One is to build a high-performing team that does it well, split it into two teams and add more people, uh, but you lose two high-performing teams that way. Yeah. The other way is to have a, an internship model where you have a high-performing team that has some space in it uh, with a group of people that are good at mentoring folks and have all the intern, the pe new people into the company cycle through that team for a few months to learn how things work and then build new teams from that output. Uh, the other thing is that if you have, um, 
You've got architecture of your software, you've got organization of your teams, and you've got the work itself in your backlog. They all have to be aligned or they cr start crashing together and don't work well. Yeah, you need alignment in those areas. So if you look at, uh, if you're familiar with Azure DevOps, it's a, it's a big uh, DevOps ALM product. Um, they have, the organization is aligned around the different product areas. So work item tracking, CI, CD, uh, artifacts, um, the different areas. So they're aligned across those different areas. And then the architecture of the application is aligned to those areas as well. So it's very easy to see going in, what the team's working on, what parts do they own, it's smoother. We're not stepping on each other's toes all the time. Uh, there's two key sets of backlog dependencies. These are gonna be your killer. The biggest killer at scale is interdependencies. You wanna break them down as much as possible, remove them, actively remove uh, uh, dependencies as much as you can, uh, cross team dependencies, and then cross uh, backlog item dependencies because you, you might just have to deliver stuff in the same sprint. That's just a reality. You might have to have two scrum teams working together to deliver a working feature because we need to deliver it quicker than having it staggered across multiple sprints. Yeah? But uh, uh, minimize them. And if you've got a lot of cross-team dependencies, your teams probably aren't organized along with the work. Yeah? I work with lots of organizations. They have a front-end team, they have a back-end team, and a database team, and they wonder why they can't get stuff done. Because every piece of value, every piece of functionality that the business wants, you need three teams to work together. Whereas if you reconfigure those teams, you can get rid of those dependencies. Make sense? We can have uh, vertical teams. So the types of dependencies, people, domain, technology, software, internal versus external, and the best way to organize teams, or the most effective way, not right for everybody, again, it's not a best practice, it's just a good practice, is uh, vertical slices. Vertical feature teams that are able to deliver functionality without dependencies outside of the team. I mentioned the Nexus integration team. Uh, they're not a, uh, this is a, 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 a um, Sorry, my brain. Nexus integration team is not generally a dedicated team, although it can be in some organizations in some circumstances. You'll need to see what works for you. But ideally, they're a team of teams. So you've got the product owner plus representatives from the other teams that get together. They leave their team, get together, figure out how they're going to solve a particular problem, and then they go back to their teams with things to put on their backlog, things that the team needs to do to go physically do the work. So if you think of the Nexus integration team as an accountability, they're accountable for working software that's all integrated together at the end of the iteration, but they're not charged with doing the work. They're charged with managing the work. A anybody here ever been on call? for you know, your software's down, yeah? So in most cases, for, uh, for the way on-call generally works is you don't actually have to do the work, you're managing the call. You make sure this thing gets completed. That might mean you go do a little bit of work, but it also might mean you have to wake somebody else up who can fix that thing or does have permission to do that thing. You're making those decisions. Same as the Nexus integration team. So in, in, in the color coding that scrum.org uses, uh, green is a product owner, blue is a scrum master, and red is a development team member. Who are the right people? And it might be different depending on the problem that you've got. If the biggest problem is, oh, we can't, the automated build system keeps failing, then you want to pull in a bunch of people that have expertise in the area of the product that it's failing in, plus, uh, in the, the, the build system. If the biggest problem is performance, then maybe you need to pull together people that understand performance optimizations in, in your code or in your application. So it's, it's who makes sense. The Nexus guy's not gonna tell you who. It's gonna tell you you need to have this group that gets together and figures that out. I, so I, I'm, I'm just fine with every time this gets together, it's a different group of people. That's, that's okay to me. 
I think you maybe want to have some common membership. I mean, product owner and a scrum master are probably going to be more common membership. And then uh, the members of that team might change out as problems arise. So it might even change many times during a sprint. Um, but I would try, and I, just like the more change you have within a sprint, the more likely things are to go wrong. So minimize the change, but don't be afraid of it as well. And I guess we've started questions, so I can, and I, I don't think there's any time for questions, but I'm quite happy to take questions, yes. The, the output of the net, so this part or the whole thing? So the output of the whole thing is a Nexus Sprint backlog, which is all of the team's individual backlogs rolled up into a view that you can look at the whole thing. If you think of that, um, uh, 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 I want to look at all work that's going to be underway during this sprint. What are the backlog items that have been pooled by the teams? But teams have their own backlog. Teams should be able to have a view of their own. That's where you probably need a tool, because doing that with stickies on the wall, you've got the Nexus one over here and the Teams one over here, and oh, I've moved that one. I need to run over here and move it on this side as well. A tool maybe works a little bit better in that circumstance. You mentioned the autonomy uh, of the teams and the teams, what they do. Yeah. So if they have their own backlog, they're kind of limited. Yeah, so the, there's, there's, there's a balance there between autonomy and alignment. That's why the line was kind of just inside of the feature. So you might, see, uh, you might see in some organizations that they, they don't have autonomy of the backlog items, just of how they go deliver them. Uh, but they always have autonomy in what they pick. Even if you've just got one scrum team, you don't put stuff in the scrum team's sprint backlog. The scrum team look at the order of the backlog, craft a sprint goal with the product owner, and then they pull the work that makes sense to achieve that sprint goal. Um, which may or may not make the product owner happy, but that's, he needs, maybe needs to provide better backlog. Yeah, because that's something that comes into the sprint planning. Did that kind of answer your question? Yeah. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, you mentioned the vertical slices of teams that everyone has one or more of parts of the software. Uh, we do have the wish of our product owner to, yeah, to do the most important thing. So what is that that to me is a prioritization problem that lies with the business um, I I would generally go sit with the business and run some exercises with them to help them figure out what the most important thing and if you don't have the most important stuff at the top of the backlog it, it's really the product owners accountable for value delivery so we need to look to the product owner to solve that problem yeah yeah that's but I, uh, probably i would go to a part of the software i don't know about and uh, another autonomy team built mm -hmm. so how to deal with that that mm. i don't know the code i'm not autonomy at the moment at autonomous the moment. yeah so i i don't know good collaboration with the product owner um, there's definitely a learning curve because the, 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 if the business um, funding shifts in the product, then maybe we're working in an uncomfortable area of the product. But I would also say um, anything in your product that's not relatively easy to understand is probably technical debt. There's that as well. I would, I would, yeah, paying back some of that technical debt. What was the software craftsmanship movement is always leave the code that you edit better than when you started. And then at least we're always getting better and we're not making it worse. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yes. So I, I, I would say that's, that's uh, the question was um, if you have uh, three teams that all need one person's time full time for the next so many sprints, uh, th that's, that's, that's a hard problem. I mean, uh, I would hope 
that a, a, a team would identify that problem soon enough that they can resolve it before they get to crunch time, but sometimes it sneaks up on us. Um, that person probably needs to pair and share their knowledge with other people um, and get it done as quickly as possible, but you're not gonna have a happy product owner. I mean, that, that's, that's just the reality. They can be like, well, how did we get, how did we not know that we had to share this knowledge? Good backlog refinement helps. Spending that time looking at what's coming up next over the next three sprints, understanding what those dependencies are, and then having those conversations with the product owner or sharing that knowledge ahead of time is always good. So um, probably gonna leave it there. Um, if you want to get a hold of me, feel free, lots of different ways uh, to do that. Um, my email's up there, uh, you can get me on Twitter and everywhere, and I guess the only last thing is... So, thank you. <laughs>